Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday service, and happy Palm Sunday to you. It's exciting as we look at what Jesus did as he comes into Jerusalem, and we prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits to reflect and rejoice and celebrate what Jesus did through his death and his resurrection as we approach the Easter week. There is a playlist if you want to sing and worship the Lord, and we'll lead you right into the sermon. You can click on that on the website. Also, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Many have used the e-transfer option, and some have brought their offerings here to the church in person or put them in the mail. Well, today we're going to look at that uh, Palm Sunday passage, the triumphal entry found in Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. Well, this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So Heavenly Father, we pray that as we bow our hearts and our heads before you, and as we reflect upon those who witnessed this historic event, It is symbolic of how we respond to Jesus. And so, Father, as we look at this, we pray that you would again remind us of our heart, of our mind and our spirit, and how we are responding to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that you would inspire us to be people of faith, people who believe, and people who rejoice, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the report came to the Roman headquarters in the Antonia Fortress. It seems that there was something significant happening on the road from Bethphage to Jerusalem as they traveled down the Mount of Olives. Crowds gathered, and some were claiming that a king was riding into Jerusalem. While the centurion was dispatched with a few soldiers to check on the disturbance, he had seen these types of royal processions before. You know, a conquering general sitting in a golden chariot, and stallions just pulling at the reins, soldiers in polished armor carrying the banner of defeated armies with prisoners walking in behind, reminding all those who defy Rome, this is what will happen to you. Well, he goes and he meets the mob descending down from the Mount of Olives. But instead of finding warriors, he finds children peasants. There's people that were blind and the lame, and they were walking after, and he wonders who's the object of their affection and their attention. And so he looks around, and then he spots him, riding not on a stallion, but on a donkey. A borrowed coat is serving as a saddle. What? Is he weeping? And he kind of shakes his head and he thinks there's not much threat to Rome here. And he rides off. Well, you know, up to this point, Jesus has resisted um, any type of public declaration of his claim to be the Christ, the Messiah. Certainly he's mentioned that to smaller groups, groups of disciples, and, and, and dropped hints here and there. But to make such a public and bold uh, demonstration was something new for him. But this was the moment. And he deliberately uh, 
brings forth this living parable to leave no doubt in anyone's mind who is watching that he was claiming to be the Messiah, the King of Israel. And so that's why it's so interesting as we look at the story once again, this familiar story to us, and we look and say, what were the reactions of the people that were there? Because they do reflect upon our reactions today and how we respond to the claim of Jesus, that he is the Savior, that he is the Christ, that he is the one that can bring us to the Father. Well, the first group that we see are those who are caught up in the moment. We find that in verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Well, it started innocently enough. Jesus had sent a few disciples to fetch a donkey that had never been ridden. But once he mounted that donkey and began to ride towards Jerusalem, people started putting two and two together, and they began to be excited. They realized what Jesus was doing. He was fulfilling prophecy. He was declaring himself to be the king of Israel, the promised Messiah. And what prophecy was he fulfilling? Well, Zechariah 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Well, there was thousands of people making the pilgrimage from all, all across the world, basically, uh, and especially from Galilee, walking up the Jericho Road, up to the top of the mountain, and now descending upon Jerusalem. And thousands would come each year to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. But few had ever really seen someone make such a bold claim before. And the fact that Jesus is doing it, even though the Sanhedrin has made it known that there is a bounty on his head, was just astonishing to many. Listen to what they said in John chapter 11, verse 57. But the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was should report it so that they might arrest him. <clears throat> well, the crowds... They were excited about what Jesus had done. Many had been there in Jericho and were traveling at the same time. And they saw Jesus heal blind Barnabas. And what an exciting moment that was. And others had just heard the stories, the rumors about what Jesus did with, for Lazarus, how he brought him back to life after being dead for four days. And so as Jesus gets on that donkey and begins to ride into Jerusalem, their excitement is just accelerating within their heart and their lives. People start cutting down palm branches and, and they shout Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. At this point, there's visions of grandeur. They're filling the hearts of the people and their mind. They wave palm branches. That's the symbol of, of Jewish freedom. I guess for us, we would wave our maple leaf. But they waved that and they threw their coats down to show that they are willing to submit themselves to his rule and his reign. That you will be our king. Hosanna. It means save us. But they weren't thinking save us like you are coming to be the savior who is going to redeem your people from their sins. That's not what they were thinking. They were thinking save us. Be the conquering Messiah who is going to overthrow Roman oppression and restore Israel to its former glory. Well, at first they tried to suppress their joy. They knew that the Romans could see them. You know, I mean, here's Antonia Fortress, and they could see the mountain, and they could see as uh, the road coming down the mountain. And, of course, <clears throat> the last thing that they ever needed was the Romans to come and see them as a threat. And maybe that's why those Pharisees that were there walking with them said to Jesus, uh, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Maybe that's why, because they didn't want to create a, a problem or a stir, at least in the eyes of Rome. But the people couldn't contain their excitement. They couldn't contain their joy. What a happy event that must have been. However, 
As the week went on, <clears throat> it appeared that Jesus had no intention of leading a revolt against Rome. Some, like Judas Iscariot, became disappointed and even a little disillusioned with Jesus. And you know, less than a week later, the mob that had gathered outside where, where Jesus is going to be brought on trial before Pontius Pilate, that crowd, instead of shouting Hosanna, no, they shouted crucify. Crucify instead. See, they had hoped that Jesus would overthrow Rome. They had expectations. They had a perception of what the Messiah would do and, and, and how he should act and, and what he would be. And when Jesus didn't fit that image, well, they were simply gone. And I wonder, how often are we tempted? Are we tempted to, to project upon Jesus an image or, or an expectation that we would have of how he should act or how he should be? And when he doesn't do what we want him to do or answer a prayer like we wanted him to answer, when he asks something hard of us, it's easy to become disappointed with Jesus. But the truth is that Jesus is asking for our lives. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, Jesus says to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up their cross and follow me. And whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. For what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? And so Jesus asks largely of us. And we can't just be there for the glory of the moment. No, we are called to be faithful followers of Christ. The second group are those that are oblivious. We find that in verse 10. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, the day that Jesus entered into Jerusalem and rode that, that donkey into Jerusalem happened to be Lamb Selection Day. We hear about that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Now that lamb would be killed on the 14th day and then eaten as the Passover meal. And as we're nearing Passover, we kind of go backwards and we say, ah, that day that Jesus rode in was lamb selection day. That means that the people of the city were busy. I mean, they were busy getting their homes ready for Passover. They were busy selecting the lamb that, would, that they would sacrifice and they would eat with their family. They were busy cleaning out all the leaven from their homes. They were getting ready for that multitude of visitors who would be descending upon the city. And many would be staying in their homes or in their guest homes. The Mount of Olives. Well, you could see it from many parts of the city. Not every part, but most parts of the city. So many would have observed this procession of happy people coming down from the mountain uh, toward Jerusalem. The priests that day also did something. They opened the gate, the golden gate, that looked directly towards Mount, the Mount of Olives. Uh, it only happened on this day. And they did that on this day to remind the people that one day, one day the Messiah would come and he would free the people from Roman oppression. Well, it's interesting that uh, they noticed the procession. They noticed Jesus approaching, but they were far too busy really to pay attention to what he was doing. They were far too busy. Yes, we see the group and they're excited, but it doesn't matter. I, I have to get this and I have to get that. I am preparing for the Passover. And because of that, they ended up missing the fact that their Passover lamb, who is Jesus Christ, had arrived. Remember what John the Baptist said? The next day, 
John saw Jesus coming toward him. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, John mentioned that a few years prior to this event, but it's still true that John recognized that Jesus would be the one who would bear the sin of the people. He would be the Passover Lamb. And Paul echoes that in 1 Corinthians where he says Jesus is our Passover Lamb. And I wonder, how often do we get too busy to consider the claims of Jesus. We get too busy with our lives that we don't even reflect on the fact that we need a Savior, that we need one to forgive us, to cleanse us, to allow us to have right standing before the Heavenly Father. And as a result, we put off any decision to make Him Savior or Lord, or any decision to accept His provision that He made. And that's the exciting thing about this Easter season. As we reflect upon all that Jesus did through his death and and through his resurrection. It's tragic though if we put that off. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And our salvation is found only on him. For only he can bear the consequences of our sin. The eternal consequences of our sin. And replace that by giving us the righteousness of God, that we might have right standing before him. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And this is the glorious exchange that Jesus takes upon himself my sin, my level of righteousness, which was sinful, and he graves to me instead His level of righteousness, which is complete purity. And now we stand before him clean and forgiven and good. Unfortunately, some people think that God is out to get them. He's kind of like a cat waiting for a mouse to kind of peek his head out of the hole and so he can pounce and that he can can, can just bring judgment and and destruction to that person. And while it's true that God is a, a just and righteous judge, and that one day he will judge the earth. We see within Jesus' actions on this day the heart of God. And the heart of God is this, that he would love us to find salvation. He would love us to find repentance. He wants us to find the peace of God that is found only in Christ Jesus. So what is Jesus doing? He's riding down now the mountain. And just as all the people could look up, he also could look across the city. And he has a beautiful view of of the city. And he sees the city in this moment. And his heart is, is burdened for them. And as he approached the city, he saw the city and he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. You can just hear the pain in Jesus' heart and mind as he basically weeps for the people. And he says, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when you and are upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And they will dash you to the ground you and the children within your walls, and they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And of course, we know that in 70 AD, the Romans did do just that, and they destroyed the temple, and they took over the city. But you know, today, as you listen to this sermon, may I ask you a question? Have you taken the time to consider what Jesus is and and, and what he offers? and what he has done and accomplished for you? Have you received Jesus as your personal Savior? Or have you been too busy running around, doing all the stuff of life? I know life is so busy, and there's so many things to do. But it's important that you don't neglect him, that you don't become oblivious to the fact that he is your Passover lamb. And you know, you can take care of that right now. We can pray a prayer together that would allow you to come to right relationship with the Heavenly Father. A prayer like this. Dear Jesus, I thank you for being willing to die upon the cross to pay for my sin. I ask you to forgive me. I don't want to ignore you. 
So today, I invite you to come into my life and to be my Lord. I want my life to be pleasing to you. And I want to experience your power and your presence. I pray. Amen. You know, it just starts with a prayer like that. A beginning of a relationship, a journey with God. Jesus will come and transform your heart and your life. Forgive you of your sin. Cleanse you. It's a tremendous thing. Will there be growth? Yes, absolutely. Will you get to know him more? Absolutely. Will he ask of things of you? Yes, he will. But this is where we start. And if you prayed that prayer, then you are not oblivious to God, where you've walked into a new relationship with him, whereby you will now walk in his ways. The third group that we meet in this uh, encounter on this triumphal entry on this Palm Sunday is the unmoved. We find that in verse 39. Now some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he said, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Now earlier I had mentioned that the chief priests opened the golden gate, hoping that the Messiah would enter the temple. So it's very interesting then that when Jesus, who is the Messiah, did enter the temple, he found the religious leaders were more, important, more, more interested in commerce than they were in prayer. You see, Caiaphas, had, the high priest at the time, had set up this bazaar. They called them the tents of Caiaphas, the bazaar of Caiaphas, within the courts of the Gentiles. So that people who were coming into Jerusalem and traveling, uh, just like that crowd, when they were trying to find and select their lamb, they could go into the temple courts and into the court of the Gentiles and purchase a lamb that was pre-approved. That way, if you bought a lamb outside and it had a blemish, it could be rejected, but these were guaranteed to be accepted uh, as a sacrifice. But the difficulty is that it needed, it was charged more money than outside and you couldn't buy it with the currency that you had in your pocket because that currency might have the image of Caesar upon it or another graven image and so you needed to exchange your money. Um, then there was money changers there. And Jesus comes in and he sees these people. They're in the court of the Gentiles where these Gentile people were supposed to be uh, able to pray and worship and yet it felt more like a shopping mall. And Jesus comes, verse 12 of Matthew 21. Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all those who were buying and selling there. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those that were selling doves. It is written, he said, my house will be a house of prayer. But you, you have made it into a den of robbers. Well, naturally, the religious leaders didn't like this too much. Jesus is messing with their system. They were making a lot of money doing this. And they looked for a way to kill Jesus. And this is the beginning where, where their hearts really turned. They, they were looking for a way to arrest him before, but now they needed to silence Jesus. They had heard how he brought Lazarus back to life, but they weren't willing to acknowledge that Jesus was from God and that he did all these things in the power of the Holy Spirit. And they didn't like the implications. The implications that he would be the Messiah, that he was the Christ. Because if that was true, then they would have to believe. And they would have to change. And they would have to repent of their sin. And they weren't willing to do that. They weren't willing to admit that they, they had sinned, that they needed a Savior. They weren't willing to admit that they needed to change their lives. See, they were religious men, but they weren't men of faith. They had come face to face with the claims of Christ. They knew his miracles were true. They couldn't deny them. In fact, many of them were present when Jesus performed them. But their pride and their self-righteous defiance didn't allow them to receive or, or to believe. Instead, they refused. And not only that, but they discouraged everyone else from believing as well. Later, after Jesus had cleansed the temple, we find in verse 14 of Matthew 21, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But... 
when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They said. Yes, Jesus said. And have you never read? From the, mouth, from the lips of children and infants, Lord, you have called forth praise. You know, even today, there are people that would rather deny the claims of Jesus. They would rather say that Jesus is not God or they would do their best to discourage people around them from putting faith in Jesus Christ. Some argue, well, science and faith doesn't mix, for instance. But you know, scientists like Newton and Faraday and many others found that it was actually their faith in God as creator that inspired them to study science and figure out how he did things. Lee Strobel, in the book Case for Faith, says if you want to debate the existence of God, well, you don't go to the physics department. No, you go to the philosophy department. Because if anything, physics is going to confirm that there is a creator, a designer of how things work. See, the evidence is clear if we are willing to consider it with an open heart. But some, like the Pharisees, they simply looked for a reason not to believe. They saw what Jesus had done and found in it a reason not to believe rather than looking at what Jesus did and acknowledging, oh, he is from God. He is the Christ. He is the Messiah. But they were so bent on not believing, even when it was more reasonable to believe. Remember when they were trying to trap Jesus and they were talking about John the Baptist? And Luke chapter 20, verse tell, uh, 2 tells us about that. Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? Well, it's interesting, Jesus is going to respond. He replies, I will ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? And basically, Jesus has told them exactly where his authority came from. His authority came from the same place as John's. Well, verse 5, they discussed it among themselves, and they said, if we say from heaven... He'll say, why did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. And so they answered, we don't know. We don't know where he came from. Now, it certainly appears, at least to me in reading this, that they knew, that they understood that Jesus was saying that he and John had the same authority and they should have believed. But instead, they chose not to believe. Again, they couldn't deny the miracles that Jesus had done. They couldn't deny the fact that John had preached with power. But they had chosen instead to harden their hearts. They had chosen instead not to believe. And you know, it's always a dangerous thing to harden your heart uh, toward God. For it makes it very difficult for us to hear the whisper of the Spirit when the Holy Spirit speaks to us and calls us to repent of sin and to find faith in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15 says, as, uh, And as has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as you did in the rebellion. It seems that, the, that those that were marching through with Moses through the wilderness had a tendency to do what the Pharisees were doing, to harden their hearts toward God and to say no, I'm not going to allow you to move in my life. And so we don't want to be like that. Well, it's better to have ears that have, listen with ears of faith. And that brings us to our last group, the devoted. Matthew chapter 20, 21, verse 6, the disciples went on and did as Jesus had instructed him. Well, I think that the 12 that were there that day as well as maybe others that had followed along in that journey with Jesus toward Jerusalem, they probably participated in that joyous day as well. That great passion, they would have cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And maybe they spoke it in a different tone than, than the others. But then again, they didn't fully understand the mission of Jesus either or the implications of what it meant for Jesus to be the Lamb of God. He had already told them that he is going to suffer and die and be raised again, but they didn't quite get it and they didn't quite understand it. But 
All they knew is right now, this was a glorious moment. But they knew Jesus. They traveled with him, and they loved him, and they trusted him. And when he said to those two, you go fetch that donkey, you go get that donkey from that home that you haven't been to. Uh, and if someone, says, if someone says something to you, well, you just are going to uh, uh, respond with this little password. We don't know if Jesus had prearranged that or if he simply knew the owner of the donkey would uh, be willing to allow it to be used for the master's use. But as they approached, verse 1, uh, Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent those two disciples saying, go to the village ahead of you and at once you'll find a donkey there with her colt, untie and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. Well, they must have been shocked because both Luke and Mark record the fact that somebody did ask them. Luke says it was the owners, and Mark says there was others that were standing around too. Hey, what do you guys think you're doing? And they must have been relieved when they had that little password, the Lord needs them, and oh, oh yeah, okay, that's right. And I think they would have been relieved to know that yes, Jesus had arranged to borrow the animal. You know, Jesus had earlier said to them, or will, sorry, later say to them in the upper room, he will say, if you love me, you will obey what I command. And you know, these disciples are demonstrating that love, that obedience right now as they do something that, that was kind of maybe a little bit awkward for them. You know, they did it because they loved him. They, they did it because they trusted him. And you know, that's really part of worship. That's really part of being devoted to Christ as we do things and we follow his commands. Why? Because we love him and we trust him. Sometimes we, we, we are tempted to think that worship is nothing more than shouting and, and rejoicing like the crowd did that day. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What a powerful worship time that was. And yes, that is a, an important part of worship. But worship also involves this desire to do what Jesus asks us to do and to be what Jesus asks us to be. They wouldn't be discouraged by the Pharisees. They would certainly face some uncertainty in the weight of, of Jesus' death and, and that in-between time between Friday and, and, and Sunday. But soon they would know the joy of the resurrection and the power of God. After Jesus ascended, after the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit was poured out, Peter and John found themselves outside of the gate, beautiful. And there was a crippled man there, and they looked at him. They said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus, Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man stood, and he leaped, and he was full of joy. Well, that caught the ire of the, the religious leaders as well. And they were brought in to give an account for how they did this. And of course they said, well, we didn't do this. This is Jesus that did this. Well, once they heard, it was the name of Jesus that healed the man. The name of the one that they were so bent on crucifying and, and killing. They wanted to get him out of the picture. And here is Jesus the risen Lord, now working through his disciples. And they began to tell them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus any longer. But Peter, in Acts chapter 4, verse 19, and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. And then they went back to the other disciples. And you know what's interesting? Their first instinct was to pray. Their first instinct was to go to God and to, to thank him, of course, for his faithfulness, but to ask God to help them to be faithful, to be devoted to him. Look, it's found in verse 29 of Acts chapter 4. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. And the Lord heard that prayer. He heard that prayer and continued to use these people to impact the world around them. 
And you know, down through the centuries, God has heard people pray that same prayer. Lord, would you let us, would you let us then be instruments of your grace to the community that we live? Would you allow us, O oh Lord, to be those that would be your hands and your feet? Would you allow us to spread this wonderful news of Jesus Christ? That's the heart of the devoted. Well, on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode that donkey's colt, proclaiming that he was the Messiah and that he had come in peace and in humility. However, the day is coming when he will ride on a white horse and he will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when he does come at that moment and that time, it will matter greatly what camp you are in and what camp I am in. Will I be or will you be someone who said, well, I tried Jesus, but he didn't answer my prayer, didn't do it the way I wanted, or will he ask me to do something that was just so difficult? He actually wanted me to give him his entire life. Can you believe it? I wasn't prepared to give him my life. And we could be in that camp. Or perhaps we're in that camp that says, I, I just was too busy. Life is so busy here on, in, in, in this time. And I haven't had time to read the Bible or consider the claims of, of Christ. I'm too busy living for here and now. And I haven't considered that which is to come. I haven't prepared for eternity. And fortunately, when Jesus comes back, it will be too late. Will you be one that, that says, despite the evidence or the testimony of those who love Jesus, I remain unconvinced? It seems that it doesn't matter what happens, you're looking for reasons not to believe rather than reasons to believe. You don't want to believe because that means you would have to change your heart and your life. You have to become obedient to Christ. Or will you be one who accepts and believes the claims of Jesus? That he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, including my sin and your sin. And that by believing in him, you actually then do experience that wonderful grace of God where he comes and forgives and cleanses your heart and he replaces it with his presence and with his peace and with his righteousness. It is a tremendous thing to know God and to serve him. And it's my sincere prayer on this Palm Sunday that you will have made that last choice, that you will be a devoted follower of Jesus Christ as well. Let's pray. So Heavenly Father, we recognize that there's all types of people. And I'm so grateful in the story that, Lord, you showed us how much you love us. This is even before you go to the cross, and you demonstrate that, obviously, through your death. But here in this moment, you wept over the city. And, Lord, maybe in this moment, you were weeping over us. And you're crying over us. And you're saying to us, will you recognize me? Will you accept me? Or will you continue to go on with your life? And I pray, O oh Lord, in that moment, as we sense your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts, that we will not harden our hearts, that we will not walk away, that we will not be oblivious to you, but instead that we will respond to your love, and we will respond to your grace, and we will respond to your call. Let us serve you. Let us know you. Let us love you. It is a great privilege to do so. And so we give you glory, and we give you honor, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you for joining me. And together, let's say it one more time. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I am so thankful that he has come to save us, that he has saved me, and that he can save you. God bless you.